Gabor Mate is a renowned doctor and expert on trauma. He's also Jewish and was born during the Holocaust in Nazi-occupied Hungary. Mate now lives in Canada, and he has been interviewed by Piers Morgan. I used to be a Zionist. I'm a, as you mentioned, I'm a Holocaust survivor. Zionism was very important for me as a salvation of the Jewish people. Until I found out that the state was founded based on the extirpation, the expulsion, and multiple massacres of the local population. And that's not historically controversial. So I'm taking a longer view of this. And I'm saying that the present situation cannot be understood without looking at the historical context. And nor can we move forward if the present occupation and the suppression of the Palestinians continue. So. Sharon, your previous guest, talked about the fragile coexistence. There was no coexistence. There was oppression, periodic massacres, um, uh, land occupation um, in the West Bank, the continuous expulsion of the population from their homes. I visited the occupied territories three times now. The first time, back during the first Intifada, Peers, I cried every day for two weeks at what I saw. So this cannot go on. And I saw the news about the Elgin marbles being returned and how you changed your mind about that. Mm. Well, how about returning the land that's been stolen from the Palestinians? I'm not talking about the state of Israel. I'm not talking about 1948. I'm talking about since 67 and what's going on right now. So there's got to be some stop to what's going on. And that's yeah. how I understand it. No, I, this I, is for the I, sake of both Israelis and Palestinians. No, I, he just talked with such authority and compassion there. I mean, you know, he, he, he's famously a psychologist. He's an expert in trauma, right? He knows how to talk about these things. Just was speaking with that, that deep compassion, I think, was incredibly disarming um, for, for Piers Morgan. I thought actually quite moving listening to that. I mean, let's take a look at another part of that debate. I completely agree with you. This is a, a never-ending cycle. I, I guess... From the Israelis' point of view, what happened on October the 7th was on such a gigantically horrific scale. I do get a sense that Israel is in a collective sense of trauma and that they are determined that Hamas should not be allowed to perpetrate such an, a massacre again. And they are on record, Hamas, just two weeks ago, their spokesman, are saying they would do it again and again and again if they can. So that represents a clear existential threat to the security of people in Israel. So I guess my, my question for you is, what should Israel's response be? Everyone is increasingly concerned about what is going on in Gaza. Clearly, the loss of civilian life is on a, 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 a catastrophic scale. Uh, nobody thinks this is right, but at the same time, I think many would share my view that Israel has a right to defend itself. The question is, how do they do that appropriately? And how do they get rid of Hamas, if indeed you think they should get rid of Hamas? Well, you're raising many questions and many fair questions. Now, look, I live in Canada, where this country was founded on the suppression and the erasure of the indigenous population and the utter denial of their narrative. And uh, in Canada, for example, there were horrendous residential schools where a few decades ago, if a native child spoke their tribal language, they'd have a pin stuck in their tongue. Now, most Canadians are not aware of that history. Most Israelis are not aware of the history of what the Palestinians have suffered. They don't know that in 1948, there were multiple massacres of large numbers of people by Israeli forces. They don't know the history, the subjective experience of the Palestinians. And in the absence of that knowledge, October 7th would just strike them as another horrific anti-Semitic event. I understand the desire for defense and certainly even a desire for revenge, but that's in the absence of knowing what the Palestinian experience has been. And the Western press, and as in all countries where the local population has been displaced, the majority of the population doesn't know the history or the subjective experience. So if you're asking me how to move forward, let's inform ourselves of the actual experience of both sides, not just one side. 
I thought that was really interesting. I mean, you know, to, to have the support in Israel for how they treat the Palestinians, I mean, you, you've either got to have a deep hatred or a deep ignorance, I think. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I assume it, it differs depending on who you're talking to, but I was talking to um, Andrew Feinstein um, yesterday, in fact, really clever guy, Jewish guy from, from South Africa. And we were talking about the differences between um, apartheid South Africa and Israel-Palestine now. And he was saying one thing he thinks is more extreme in Israel than it was in South Africa, is that Israelis, Jewish Israelis, are able to quite successfully just completely ignore the existence of Palestinians. You know, Gaza, he says he, he sort of, you know, met people on the beach in Tel Aviv or whatever. And uh, people spoke as if there was no one in Gaza, you know, that, that, that Palestine didn't exist. They have a life which is completely insulated from the suffering of people in Gaza and the West Bank. And therefore, when October the 7th comes around, it's just this, this complete surprise by these barbarian hordes who presumably can only be motivated by anti-Semitic hate, right? Now, you know, it's, it's, it's irrelevant to the question of justification, I think, to say that's not a very good explanation of what happened on October the 7th, right? The explanation, which isn't a justification, involves the fact that you have a people who have been laid siege to, occupied, oppressed, suppressed, and you, you have a people next to them doing the oppressing, or whose government are doing the oppressing, whose army are doing the oppressing, who are, who are able to be completely ignorant of that. And I think uh, Gabor Mate sort of talking about the, the value of just knowledge and understanding, right, learning about this, which also is a good thing to do as a guest, right? Because often what will happen is this host will be will be trying to ask, what's your solution? What do you think the policy outcome should be? And he's like, look, I'm just here to say maybe we should understand everyone involved here and maybe that will help, right? You know, it might not solve the goddamn problem, but it can't, it can't hurt, can it, to bring about some understanding. I mean, it can hurt Israel or the Israeli government ambition to have a greater Israel because obviously if people understand more the situation of the Palestinians, they are going to be less accepting of the genocidal war that Israel are currently mounting. But if you have any you know, ounce of humanitarianism in you, then understanding is not going to hurt. Gabor Mate went on to directly address um, the question of whether Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has the right to defend itself. Every country does. But Israel has no right to impose an occupation on people. Now look, I was born in Hungary. In 1956, when I was 13, studying for Bar Mitzvah, there was the great Hungarian revolution against Soviet occupation. And uh, it was after that revolution that we became refugees and came to Canada. Now, did Russia have the right to defend itself against the Hungarian revolutionaries? You know, so, the, and, and mostly when we talk about Israel's right of defense, we're taking isolated Palestinian actions, but we're not saying that this population also has the right to defend against, against the occupation. I'm not justifying the, the terrible events of October the 7th. I'm talking in the absence of historical awareness. It all just looks like Israel defending itself. But against whom? Against the population that has been massacring in a number of thousands for 80 years and taking their lands and destroying their homes and jailing their children and torturing them. That's the history. Now, unless we know that, it all looks like this poor little country trying to defend itself, but against whom? Against people that's been occupying and displacing for 80 years. That's the history, as Israeli historians have shown. I don't make this stuff up. I wish it wasn't true. I wish I could believe in the dream of the Jewish state. I love that dream, except I found out at what price, at what nightmare, that imposed on the Palestinians? I think that was really important there as well. You know, he, he, he wants to believe in Israel, right? He's, I mean, he survived the Holocaust, right? I mean, he was, he was, he was a baby. But I mean, I was reading his Wikipedia, actually. I think he, he said even as a, as a very small child, he suffered a lot of trauma in part because his mum had to give him up for a few weeks to save his life. And then in his childhood that created a lot of resentment towards his mum for that. You know, obviously his mum had made the right decision, but, you know, that inevitably fills your life with trauma, even if you were a baby at the time. Um, David, what did you make of that interview? And also, I suppose, I mean, maybe this is a, a bit of a forward question, but you're, you're sort of North American, liberal, Jewish background. I mean, do you, are you coming from a similar place as, as Gabor Mate? 
or are you is that is, is that okay to say i mean i could i could give a whole life story of i my own trajectory through the jewish world i come from a very divided family my my mother was raised as a kind of uh, true american jew you know um along the lines that you would see from a uh, chuck schumer for example someone who believes in the greatness of the united states but also in a deep fidelity to the project of zionism as the one and only place where our people could be free and protected and safe after so many decades of pogroms and holocaust and then my father's family who come out of the parisian resistance who fought the nazis on the continent and were refugees following the war, uh, who were deeply anti-Zionist and, and never, even from, you know, in the 40s and 50s, never at all felt aligned with or complicit in uh, the, uh, you know, uh, transmission of one genocide against the Jewish people to another against the Palestinian people. And I was raised kind of in that tension in a very Zionist community. Um, it just by nature of growing up in the United States, you know, Los Angeles is a, a huge hub for Zionist thinking and behavior and, 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 and financing for the Israeli project as well. And so I think, you know, that experience taught me that it's not just ignorance and hatred, as you said before, Michael, it's also a, a genuine kind of fear. Uh, you know, the the, the Zionist mind uh, understands anti-Semitism as a, a kind of global virus. So when it's not just October seventh, and it's not just other moments of Palestinian violence that inform this more callous view of why uh, it is only might that can make right for the Jewish people, it's that. You know, every terror attack in Paris or London or Madrid or Michigan or Argentina is part of the same raison d'etre of Israel. Every instance of campus anti-Semitism, every slur, every report about rising hatred of the Jewish people, every politician that is able to inflame that fear, every fear-stoking page on the in the in the Sun magazine talking about the potential exodus of Jews from Britain on account of the Labour Party's radical politics on Palestine, all of this informs that sense of fear, and we know what fear can do. We know what type of crimes fear legitimates because we all lived through the war in Iraq. We all lived through the bombing in Afghanistan that were justified on the basis of U.S. security, our security, you know, a war that had a full and explosive mandate from the public opinion of the United States. And I, so I don't think that uh, it's necessarily just, uh, you know, easy to, I, I hate this language of both sides, you know, that we just need to sit down and promote greater understanding. Because for Israel, this isn't a conflict between Israel and Palestine. For Israel and Israelis and Zionists worldwide, this is a conflict against anti-Semitism. You know, and they trace their, their um, you know, view, their conviction to uh, a, a re the regional war, right? They consider, obviously, less Lebanon, they consider Syria, they consider Jordan, they consider Egypt. These are existential threats that surround the nation of Israel, right? So I don't believe in this. I think it's easy to get caught up in a kind of Good Friday metaphor uh, or a South African one. You know, this isn't a question of empathy and understanding. Uh, of course, I do believe that those will be critical to, the, to, to charting a, a path towards a peace process and, and a solution uh, that uh, provides for the free self-determination of the Palestinian people. But I think it's critical to get inside the mind of what Israel and its Zionist allies across the world are thinking. Now, the problem with that line of thinking is only that it is wrong. It is wrong to think that oppression, dispossession, and occupation are the path to safety for the Jewish people. It is wrong to think that Zionist crimes are the way to instantiate and defend the project of Israel. It is wrong to think that sending weapons, endless military support to Israel makes Jews safer across the world. It is wrong to think that exploding the United Nations in the name of Israeli and Jewish exception is the way to defend the Jewish people. That's the problem. The problem isn't necessarily that Israelis hate Palestinians. I'm certain that a huge, overwhelming proportion do. I'm, it's not only that you know Israelis are ignorant of the Palestinian plight, although you're Michael, I'm sure you're right, that an overwhelming percentage of Israelis are able to live because of Iron Dome and you know the expansive um, occupation at the frontiers of the Zionist project in that uh, blissful ignorance. But it is also that uh, deeply rooted fear 
And until we can address that logic, that faulty logic, that might will make right. And this is the logic that's often cited by Netanyahu, that, all, that the weak will crumble and it's only if Israel defends itself. Right? And it's critical for us to de deconstruct and dismantle that notion of defense. It's only going to be by proving that Zionism is not the greatest source of safety for the Jewish people, but rather it's the greatest threat to the Jewish people and our safety across the world. It's only by making that case visible and clear that we can dismantle the logic that I think informs the Zionist project from the late 19th century through its present incarnation today. I mean, I suppose, I mean, it's a big topic, but it's come up a few times with, with you and also Barnaby on the show sort of making a, a similar argument. And if I was a, a Zionist Jew, I would respond by saying, I mean, what's your, your evidence? I mean, uh, the threat to Jews throughout most of history has had nothing to do with Zionism, right? Why would it be the case that post-1945, the Jews could have had a perfectly peaceful, brilliant existence um, if only they haven't, hadn't created Israel? I mean, the experience they just had was of the Holocaust where six million Jews were killed because, you know, not that they were weak, but because they didn't have any means to, to successfully resist that. So you, I, I can see why um, after the Holocaust, sort of the Zionist argument that unless you have your own state, you are going to be vulnerable was 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 persuasive. So, I mean, how how do you respond to that argument? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've spent much of your life having this conversation. So this is more to, to get you to in, inform me how this conversation plays out. But how do you respond to that point? Well, I think it requires us to look at the birth of the Jewish nation and get behind the kind of cynicism of what this actually was, right? This was not about responding to the logic of Jewish safety and, and, and self-determination. This was about resisting uh, Jewish immigration to places like Britain and the United States that closed their doors to my family. Uh, which is the reason why my father's family had to flee eventually from France to Switzerland out to Australia. Now, uh, you know, I don't, without overstating uh, or understating the the extent to which you know anti-Semitism remains uh, a very um, real and, and virulent um, a strand of social politics that can, goes around the world, I think you know this. We have to take seriously the 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 ways in which Zionism both informs that anti-Semitism around the world, uh, and, and you know the, the number of crimes that are committed with the Star of David, our holiest you know Jew, religious symbol, you know over the the bodies of dead Palestinians. That doesn't make me feel safe. But also, you know, being from the diaspora, um, you know, having family in places like Australia, places like the United Kingdom, you know, growing up in California, a place that felt very safe for Jews. These are big Zionist communities. I mean, there's a certain irony of Chuck Schumer from New York saying the only place Jews can be safe is in Israel, where, you know, you're talking from the United States. What Aren't we defending the liberal democratic values of those countries where, where where Jews reside, aren't isn't that also part of this project, right? As opposed to investing in a war machine that's done in the name of, of Jewish identity, right? And to, to total totally counterproductive uh, ends. And so I I think that it's both critical to contest the notion that Zionism was in any way. Uh, you know, motivated as a global project by a defense of the Jewish people back then, but also today to ask ourselves, well, where are Jews safe? What are the contexts in which, you know, the Jewish people are able to live and thrive and those communities are able to, you know, uh, uh, coexist with others? And the answer is not uh, in, in Israel, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't require Israel to be, uh, in, to, to be so bloodthirsty, to be so discriminatory, to be so, uh, to have created this apartheid, right, in the name of their defense, to double down in increasing crimes and complicity um, with, you know, settler violence at, at their borders, to go drifting further, inexorably drifting further to their, to their fascist right until they have a cabinet composed of people who openly identify as homophobic fascists, right? So to me, part of it is understanding that un, uh, internal logic that is kind of a centrifuge uh, of a fascist centrifuge in, 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 the, in the Zionist um, advance or, you know, the, the internal logic of the Zionist project in Israel, but also looking at what are the components of um, uh, a sort of, you know, you could call it a democratic or liberal society, but a, a, a pluralist society in which Jews have been able to live and thrive all, all around the world. And so to point a finger at Israel and say, this is the only place that Jews are safe and, and, and thriving, when clearly Jews in Israel feel more in battle today than they ever have. Right? So even on its face, that logic doesn't make sense to me. But as a Jew who grew up, you know, in other parts around the world, 
uh, very happy, you know, Jew who, who grew up, you know, able to have conversations about what is our past, what is our present, what is our future. I don't accept the argument that Israel is what keeps us safe. I feel much more threatened by what Israel is is doing in terms of poisoning the well of the world's view of the Jewish people.